Good afternoon. I hope you don't fall asleep. The um, panelists promised to be um, interest to give uh, an interesting outview of uh, the justice system of our countries. Uh, my name is Lydia Cacho. I'm from Mexico, and I will chair this this panel. I will try to chair this Latin American guys panel. Uh, we will aim to survey the jurisprudential developments to discuss emerging trends and to identify specific cases we should watch for during 2016. Um, just to give you an overview, the Americans are second only to Western Europe in levels of freedom of, of speech and human rights, the defense of human rights. Uh, 36 countries um, with 982 million people contemplate uh, Latin America. And on this table, we have a different array of countries with different justice systems, but we can um, try to have a clear trend in censorship on political interest on controlling the conventional press and creating control mechanism um, to control internet communications. We have certain trends all over Latin America, even though we have such different uh, justice systems and all panelists will talk about this. So we have here on the table Brazil, uh, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia, but uh, Colombia, in this case, our panelists will uh, talk about the Americas. So uh, we, we decided to organize the panel in such a way that we go from, from these countries until the end, in which um, Catalina Botero will talk about the region and the, the, the new findings and, and the, the new um, developments uh, according to the Inter-American Human Rights Protection System. So we have first Thais Gasparian Borja. She's graduated in law by Facultad de Derecho de Universidad de Sao Paulo and gra graduated also in uh, philosophy and human sciences in the University of Sao, Sao Paulo. She enrolled with the Brazilian Bar Association and has a master's in philosophy and jurisprudence by Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de San Paulo. Uh, Gasparian was chief of staff of the Ministry of Justice in 2002 and a member of the board of directors of La Asociación de Abogados de Sao Paulo. She's also participated in the Special Commission for Immaterial Property um, in Sao Paulo, uh, or the Copyright. Um, association and is a member of the Asso Asso Association Association Brasileira do Direito Autoral, which is also copyright. Uh, Ms. Gasparian practices civil law and is consulting on service and litigations, especially regarding freedom of speech. So she will give us uh, a presentation of the most important um, jurisprudence on the on last year, and we'll talk about this year after she finishes. Yes, hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to thank Columbia University for the opportunity to share ideas with such a sophisticated audience. And especially, I'd like to thank Agnès Calamar and all her team, uh, Ba and Holly, to, for all the work they have uh, during this meeting with us. Uh, I will address here only, uh, I've been working with freedom of expression for nearly 30 years now. So that, that doesn't mean that I'm getting a, uh, old, but <laughs> that, uh, yes, I began working when I was two or three years old. <laughs> That's why. And uh, I, I've just, I have really a lot of things to, to talk about Brazil, but I prefer to, to hear you. So I'm going to be very quickly, I'll try to be very, very quickly. I brought a presentation. What do, where do I have the... So I will address now uh, only two cases. Uh, one uh, which was decided, what judged in 2015, and one that maybe is going to be decided in 2016. So um, they are very important case. And the first one is related to biographies. Because I just want to show you uh, the scenario that we had in Brazil uh, for the last few years, or 
some years that we have uh, a scenario very bad in terms of a publication of biographies, uh, things like that. So uh, for a number of years, there's, there's been an increase of legal battles against uh, the publication of biographies in newspapers, in magazines, and books. People whose unauthorized biographies had been written would attempt to ban or suspend the sale of books and newspapers. I give you some examples. The first of such attempts took place in 1991, when a Sao Paulo tabloid newspaper, the Notícias Populares, uh, literally popular news, decided to publish in seven chapters the story recounting the details about the life of a well-known Brazilian singer and composer, Roberto Carlos. Maybe in Latin America you have already heard about Roberto Carlos. Roberto Carlos is so famous in Brazil that he's commonly uh, referred to as the king. He's also known that he uh, suffered from a very traumatic experience in his childhood. He was hit by a train in the small town where he lived and had to have his leg amputated. The Notícias Populares newspapers promised to tell everything about the king's tragedy. And how, in spite of it, he overcame the dif difficulties and became the most popular singer in the country. You can see the doctor here saying, I've cut up Roberto's leg. And uh, the saw, uh, you can see the saw, see saw, so you can see the saw, the blood gushing out, and uh, that's a very uh, bloody, it was a very bloody edition of the Notícias newspapers. So um, Roberto Carlos, years later, in, in 2006, I think, no, yes, the first one the, the, had been censored because he, he, uh, he, after the third very bloody and disturbing chapter, Roberto Carlos filed for a court order and he managed to cancel all, all, all those other chapters. And years later, in, 2000, in 2006, he, uh, again, he managed to stop the sale of an authorized biography on him. And for both times, he uh, succeeded his, this attack to freedom of expression. That's why the singer has been the leading celebrity in the war on unauthorized biographies in Brazil. Cases such as these have been recurrent and successful in Brazil in recent years. Uh, some of cases are displayed here. I'm going to quick through them. Uh, just to, to show. And last year, uh, we had uh, a, bi a biography on uh, Mick Jagger's. Uh, a, sh a chapter of this biography has been also removed from a translation in Brazil, just because a former affair of his, who is Brazilian and the mother of one of his children, did not appreciate the terms in which their relationship was recounted in the work. So there are innumerable examples that uh, in this sense, not only on biographical books, but also of newspapers, articles, special, especially pieces on politicians during local elections. Uh, the court decisions banning all kinds of biographical works from being published were grounded on some articles of the civil code, which protect rights involving privacy, image, honor, and the names of the individuals. The most important decision in Brazil last year or so was uh, a decision on biographies. Uh, an appeal of this subject was judged by the Supreme Court. Justice Carmen Lucia wrote the opinion which determined that biographies do not need to receive a prior approval of the subjects, their families or heirs, as a condition for publication. Justice Carmen Lucia warned that freedom is not an absolute right, rather it is a never-ending and ongoing fight in Brazil. She also expressly declared that any kind of authorization for publishing biographies is a private form of censorship. 
This decision is very important for Brazilian citizens because it establishes a binding precedent. Authors are now free to publish biographies without any authorization from the other party, and current lawsuits imposing such a burden shall be dismissed following the Supreme Court decision. That has been the most important decision in Brazil, but I also like to point out one case that might to be uh, this, that maybe it's going to be decided in 2016. Um, this uh, this case uh, it's going to be of a cardinal importance for Brazilian citizens. Um, he has uh, even considered uh, as a topic of general repercussion in Brazil. I'm not going to explain you what exactly general repercussion in Brazil is, but just to explain that it's the name uh, given to a tool that we have in our legal system. It's a requirement intended to ensure that only issues that are highly, re highly relevant to the Brazilian society are heard by the Supreme Court. Uh, so uh, this this case uh, it is uh, not very it's a curious one, but uh, it has na it, it, it's named it topic 837, and is um, the Supreme Court seeks to address the boundaries in this case it seeks to address the boundaries of freedom of expression versus of the rights of equal stature in the legal system. The case that gave rise to this topic was a lawsuit filed by an organization called the Independents against an NGO called Animal Hope Project. The Independents organized the Barretos Cowboy Festival, which is a rodeo. This kind of festival is very popular in Brazil with cowboy shows on bulls and horses. The suit was filed because this NGO launched a campaign that gave out the following message. People who sponsor rodeos also torture animals. The independents argued that the affirmation that animals are tortured was false and that they had lost sponsorship because of the piece the NGO published on their website. They asked that the web, web page be deleted. This situation, which seems extremely simple, may be the case used to define the boundaries of freedom of press in Brazil, because the court has to decide whether or not a web page or information can be deleted from the internet. This case is yet to be defined, and Supreme Court's decision will be applied across the country, hence their importance. Um, I also would like to, to speak something about the right of reply. It's a law that we have in Brazil, but I think that we can uh, speak it later. Okay. So, okay, sure. thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Thais. Uh, we now have Dario Ramirez. Uh, I, I don't want to speak from him. Oh, Okay, Dario Ramirez is from Mexico. He used to be the director of, of the UK-based uh, organization Article 19. Um, he is an experienced human rights uh, defender. He is an um, expert in public international law and media law, and he worked for the Ministry of Interior previously um, in Mexico. And uh, he also worked as, when he was young as uh, for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, so he has a lot of experience in, in protecting journalists and, and specialized in that in the last 10 years. He holds a master's degree in public international law uh, from the University of Amsterdam. And he will talk about um, some um, very important cases um, that were, were raised uh, during 2015 and 2016 in Mexico. So that you, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation, Agnes and the University of Columbia. It is, it is a privilege to, to speak before you. Um, the title of the, of the presentation is that I, I couldn't find any, anything better. I think it's just like weird legal ideas in Mexico. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I always struggle very much in the international fora to explain um, how Mexico it is a, a, a dichotomy and how the, our reality really strikes, as, as, uh, strikes to many of you that, that we are uh, living what are we experiencing in Mexico. In the 
as a as an international player, Mexico is a, is a progressive is a progressive actor defending uh, human rights in the Human Rights Committee or the special mechanisms. Uh, but inside, the reality is that it's um, the the country is crumbling with uh, grave violations of human rights. Um, I think it's, although it's not really politically correct to say it so bluntly, but in Mexico we are facing a state of, of emergency. The priority of the, of the government is to implement a security policy that, of course, affects human rights and, um, and, and including freedom of expression in, in, at its core. Um, and really it's not, I'm, I, don't, I don't believe, uh, or I don't ask for you to just uh, believe if this is true or not. But uh, when you have a country where 27,000 persons are disappeared, and we don't know how many forcibly disappeared, when we have 96, 96 journalists being murdered since, since 2000, and when we have uh, seven women killed daily because just being women, uh, or where tw 27 human rights defenders have been killed since 2010, then I think, uh, and I could go on, of course, but the time is of the essence. I think this this really puts Mexico in a in a really um, well in the in, in a really tough spot to say uh, if we are a convincing democracy or not. Um, but I think the, the the main issue is that it's it's really difficult for a for a for the exercise of a human right such as um, freedom of expression to to survive, and, and I would like to stress the, the word survive, in a corrupt system in which is impunity is uh, it's almost certain in 99% of the cases. Um, I think that in, in that regard, human rights violations are common, and of course all of them, or 99%, lies in, in, in impunity. Now, impunity, it does affect uh, many, uh, a lot of actions of the state, of course, but impunity lies within two powers of the state. First, uh, the executive that is in charge of criminal investigations, uh, and it is a collapsed system uh, where the investigations are weak, the investigations are, are in the, uh, at, for, since the beginning, are uh, meant not to be, not to reach uh, a conclusive argument that would help the judge or would help the, the judicial system to take, a, to take an important decision. Uh, in that case, it is um, it, it, the, the blame is in both whether the judiciary doesn't have good cases to rule upon, and the executive or the police that doesn't present very well unstructured cases. Um, in a state where public security is a, is a top priority, the fight for information and, and scrutiny of public officials is an ongoing battle, of course, for human rights defenders and, of course, for journalists. And in this case, Mexico is not, is not this, the, the excep exception. Um, you may never have heard of a verb, verb called hawking. Um, but we have that in Spanish, and, and for you that whoever speaks Spanish is alconeo. And the, the, the word or the verb hawking came out, um, uh, the origin of the, of the verb is, uh, well in a nutshell, is that members of the organized crime uh, have uh, vigilantes in certain cities. Uh, at the bus stops, uh, bus stations, airport stations, taxis, and they provide a very well-equipped uh, system of communications, uh, and they monitor who goes into the city, who goes out, out of the city, and, and of course, who's doing what. You know? And so this, this network of hawking does exist uh, uh, from members of organized crime, and of course, members of, of the public, uh, public officials that are part of, the, of this uh, organized crime. So uh, the, the idea is to gather information. Right to gather information of uh, anything that can be of use for these uh, networks. Um, now, the, 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 we have uh, uh, in 90 criminal codes, we have the verb, we have the, the, the crime of hawking in, in Mexico. It may, at, at now, I mean, it's, it, I will try to say, I'm just, uh, I'm sorry for the, for the translation, but just for you to have an idea, in the state of Veracruz, 
um, which uh, in the last uh, five years, 19 journalists have been killed. The, the penal code, the, the, the article 341, says, who in order to plan or execute a crime or obstructing the public safety function, performs any act aimed to obtain or transmit by any means information on the characteristics of the public security institutions, enforcement and just administration activities, and execution of penalties and security measures in any field or any public servant, official, or worker. In Chihuahua, uh, Article 284 says, crime against the security of the community, that's what it's called, who lurks, monitors, or perform any act aimed to obtain information such as the location, activities, operation, or in general, any related work performed by members of public security institutions and the Army and the Navy. And it just uh, goes on. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's jail time for, for that. So the, the good, well, the good thing is that um, we manage, uh, well, Article 19 managed, <laughs> uh, to, to have two cases uh, brought before the, the, the Supreme Court. The first thing is, the, the good news is that the Supreme Court ruled on two amparos that were presented by two journalists uh, and striking uh, the unconstitutionality of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the crime of hawking. And uh, the first chamber of the National Supreme Court uh, conceded uh, these amparos uh, in favor of the, of the journalists in Chiapas. And I think that the, the, the good thing is that any, any, um, any well, the bad thing is that those, uh, only those two journalists, they, 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 the law is still in, play, still in place. It hasn't been uh, reformed. But those Amparo only covers those two journalists. So the rest of the journalists still have to go through that legal uh, 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 adventure to, to get that, the, the support of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, I think, of course, the, the court recognized that the scope of the norm included the activities of journalists and activists and threatened the right of freedom of expression. Uh, I think it's, it's very important to say that um, Although we have 19 states with this uh, uh, crime in the penal codes, uh, the, 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 I, I would say that the tendency is that with the ruling of the Supreme Court, um, they will, we have leverage as activists and human rights defenders to go and push for the reform of those uh, 19 laws. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, um, Next, uh, we have Agustina del Campo. She comes from Argentina, and um, she's the director at the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Universidad de Palermo, and an international human rights consultant. Ms. del Campo has a law degree from Universidad Católica Argentina and international legal studies from the American University in Washington College. Uh, she previously ran the impact litigation uh, cases before the Inter-American Commission and Court on Human Rights. Agustina has extensive experience in human rights training, particularly as it relates to freedom of expression and the press in the Inter-American Human Rights System. She taught and lectured in several Latin American countries and the U.S. Additionally, Agustina has authorized and contributed to over a dozen pu publications. Agustina, please. Thank you. Uh, first, let me thank Colombia President Bollinger Arias and all her team. This has been an amazing conference, again, for the third year. Um, let me first say that it was a good year, jurisprudence-wise, in Argentina. Uh, last year was an, ele an electoral year. Uh, we had our first presidential debate ever. Uh, so that was good. And we had three cases coming out of the Supreme Court, two on access to information and one on defamation, that uh, move forward the protections of freedom of expression in the country. So I'm going to talk about three main issues, access to information, defamation, and touch upon some cases that are coming up uh, on internet-based liability. So on access to information, there were two relevant cases uh, brought by Congress people. The first was a Congresswoman, Ms. Tolvitzer, who filed 
uh, complained against the Minister of Justice and Human Rights demanding access to the Articles of Incorporation of um, a company that was registered with the Office of Corporate Oversight within that ministry. The government had alleged that providing this information would violate the personal data protection law and that the Congresswoman lacked a legitimate interest to ask for this information. The court basically ruled that there was no sensitive personal data on the Articles of Incorporation and it was the duty of the registry that uh, was within the ministry to provide this information which was considered public. Uh, it then went on to say that there was no need for a legitimate interest of any kind and that the fact that uh, she was a congresswoman did not strip her of her rights, uh, of her basic human rights to uh, access information. So although she did have other channels to request this information, this was a perfectly good one. Um, the second case that the court decided was the YPF case and this was brought by Congressman Giustiniani against YPF, which is like an oil company in Argentina. Uh, the majority of the shares of this company are owned by the states. So YPF had a contract with Chevron, and it was a secret contract for a while. Um, Giustiniani wanted access to information based on a number of environmental laws to do an environmental impact assessment. Um, so he requested access to this contract and that the contract be publicly distributed to the entire population. The government alleged that the decree that rules on access to information did not apply to a state-owned company, that there were industrial secrets that uh, were within, were built within the agreement and therefore cannot be disclosed, and there, that there were due process issues since Chevron was not a, part, a party to this um, litigation, so that in order for the court to rule on this, they had to bring on Chevron. So um, the court basically ruled that it was a state-owned company, that the director was appointed by the executive power, and uh, based on that premise and a number of other considerations, um, it, was, it was very well under the decree um, granting access to information and therefore um, they, they had to view whether to grant access or not within the framework of said decree. Uh, regarding the industrial secrets, it did acknowledge that within the framework of the decree, it was an accepted except, a exception. However, they stated that a state cannot broadly argue industrial secrets without showing that there would be some damage in disclosing the, the agreement or the contract and that the state failed to do that connection. They very broadly and vaguely argued that there were state um, industrial secrets. Regarding the due process argument, they interestingly concluded that Chevron knew that YPF was a state-owned company and therefore knew or should have known that it was subject to public scrutiny and to transparency rules. So this was uh, an interesting move forward in access to information standards. Um, on defamation, which is the third case that the Supreme Court viewed this year, uh, there was an interesting case, Mr. Roviralta versus the First Media Interactive Network and others. Uh, this was basically for the publication of an advertising uh, or advertisement in a um, na nationwide newspaper. Mm -hmm. Mr. Um, Roviralta, well, the ad played with Mr. Roviralta's name and his personal history. He's uh, known for his former uh, marriage to a uh, TV local star and a very loud divorce where he ended up with 50% of her assets. Um, so the legend at the end of the ad read, if you like to live off others, don't let it show. Um, so the court basically said, uh, that regardless of the content of the actual advertisement, it was clearly attributed uh, to the third party. It was a company advertising for internet uh, services. 
So it was clearly attributed to a third party. It was produced by a third party, and it was, it was not endorsed by the newspaper. So therefore, the newspaper could not be held liable for uh, its content. So it was kind of a New York Times v. Sullivan kind of argument without citing directly to it. Um, on internet-related cases, um, the court this year did not have any new developments on this. In 2014, they decided the Belen Rodriguez case, which basically adopted a limited liability uh, for intermediaries in, in, the, in the internet. So following that case, the Federal Civil and Commercial Court of Appeals decided uh, in MMP versus Yahoo that an injunction or a precautionary measure requesting content takedown should previously have a request for directly done to the company indicating precisely the URLs that were infringing on her rights um, in order to, to then move to the judicial instance. So it was a requirement to first give notice to the intermediary uh, and clearly state which were the, the violations. On a second case on copyright law, uh, Ms. Kodama, who's the widow of Borges, a very well-known writer in Argentina, uh, sued Taringa and others, um, a website for copyright infringement. Um, so Taringa allows for users to post content, and uh, a lot of the writings of Mr. Borges ended up on Taringa's website. Um, she argued that uh, this was copyright infringement, and the Court of Appeals basically said that um, the, the website could not be held liable for third-party um, posted content. Um, she is, she's, a, she's um, appealing this decision to a higher instance, and we'll see what the higher instance says. Her basic argument is that unlike Yahoo or Google, who are the defendants in the Belen Rodriguez case, Taringa actually hosts the copyrighted content. Um, so we'll see what the, what the higher courts um, say in that regard. Um, just to finish up, I'm going to deal with the emerging norms in the Q&A, mm -hmm. but uh, two issues that I want to bring up and just mention, and then I'll discuss them further in the Q&A. There were two developments in late last year and beginning of this year that are sort of worrisome. Uh, they're not jurisprudence related, but they will be. Uh, one is the irregular amendment of the media law, and the other one was the adoption of an anti-protest protocol by the Ministry of Security in Argentina. So with that, okay. thank you. Thank you. So last but not least, we have Catalina Botero Marino. You might know her. She is an international consultant on human rights and international law and a professor with the Universidad Externado Law School in Colombia. She was special rapporteur for freedom of expression in the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and of the Organization of American States from 2008 until 2014. Um, her CV is really long and interesting. And um, I will tell you that she's an author of several books and essays publishing in different countries, some freedom of expression, constitutional law, international criminal law, and transitional justice. She received her law degree in 1988 at the Universidad de los Andes, uh, where she postgraduate there. And then uh, she went to Madrid, Spain, to on, on study. And then to sum it up, in, in Mexico and many countries in Latin America, Catalina is known as the second virgin of Guadalupe because she keeps saving people, especially journalists, from staying in jail or going to jail. So Catalina will give us a, an overview of um, regional issues regarding the inter-American uh, system. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you especially for this generous <laughs> presentation, especially coming from you. <laughs> which are really yes, a Guadalupe. Yes, sure. So <laughs> I feel honored. I would like to start, of course, by thanking uh, Columbia University and uh, its president, Lee Bollinger, and Agnes Caramar and her team uh, for this generous invitation um, to join you this afternoon. And of course, I'm also very honored to have this extraordinary panel, panel colleagues. 
For this presentation, I will uh, mention the most important freedom of expression cases of the Inter-American Human Rights Protection System from 2015. And then I will briefly mention some of the most important cases in defamation, um, in, in, in criminal defamation, uh, in some countries as Ecuador and Venezuela. I'm not going to say anything about Brazil or Mexico or Argentina, but I would like to focus, just mention important cases on Venezuela and Ecuador. Okay. Uh, with regard uh, to the inter-American system, I would like to begin with a short introduction, uh, looking at some of the trends at the inter-American court during the last uh, decade. Since its uh, founding, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has played a key role on issues of freedom of expression in the region. The court's golden age on this issue took place between 2001 and 2008. During that period, the court made important decisions on a broad range of issues, including the prohibition of prior restraint and the prohibition of the crime of slander or desacato, special protection for free speech in the public interest and from the disproportionality of criminal defamation, the right to access to information as a fundamental right, and the prohibition on the use of state power and resources to reward or punish media outlets. In these cases, the court employed a very sophisticated, a very sophisticated uh, test or uh, scruti scrutiny uh, of states' actions to limit expressions on matters of public interest. However, starting in 2009, the trend at the court started to change. At first, the change was slight. It was limited to dismissing some pleadings on technicalities or simply omitting analysis of aspects of the cases related to the right to freedom of expression. Although these approaches did cause to court to miss opportunities to move forward in defining freedom of expression standards, at least it did not explicitly reverse any of the progress made. An example of this uh, was the case Uskateri et al. versus Venezuela. You, if you are interested in this case or anything of what I'm saying, you can go to the article that I'm, to the paper that I'm sending to Columbia University. Yet, in a split decision, in 2013, the case Memoli of Ar versus Argentina, the court issued the most regressive judgment on this issue in, in, in its history. It will not digress here to exp I will not digress here to explain the whole thing, but I would like to mention at least three of its most prosperous failings. First, the court studied the application of specific criminal laws on defamation, which it had per se previously found to be in violation of the convention. In this case, however, it had no objection to the same laws. Second, it completely eliminated applications of the tripartite test under the convention by finding that the criminal conviction of a journalist for reporting mismanagement of a public good could only be questioned in an international forum if it was clearly unreasonable omitting any application of strict scrutiny that characterized these cases in the past. Third, it found that the fact that the journalist's property had been seized and held for 16 years did not affect the right to freedom of expression. The Memoli case was not a politically important case. There was no important organizations defending the journalist. And in general, the Inter-American Court does not end up in the Latin American media spotlight. However, after the court, after the court published the judgment, the most important newspapers in the region published devastating articles criticizing the court. 
15 media outlets in different countries, including O Globo in Brazil, Estadao in Brazil, eh, La Nación in Argentina, El Tiempo de Colombia, El Universal de México, El País de España. 15 of the most important newspapers within the whole region published articles that were very critical of the judges' actions in this case. One could argue that this unexpected public reaction is what moved the court in 2015 to return to the guarantees it abandoned in 2009. Essentially, in 2015, the court issued important judgments that once again raised freedom of expression standards. Another factor that could have influenced this ch change is Venezuela's region decline in 2015 and the correspondent decline in the illegal current the country had been supporting in the region. Whatever the reason, the truth is that in 2015, judgments that I am about to summarize, in the judgment that I am about to summarize, uh, the court once again takes up the strong precedence it set towered during the first decade of this century. The, case I, the cases I will be uh, addressing are the cases of uh, Marcel Granier et al, Radio Caracas Televisión versus Venezuela, and the case of López Lón et al, al versus Honduras. I will not mention the case of Omar Humberto Maldonado et al, Chile, because Sandy Colliver yesterday in her presentation uh, spoke about this case. The case of Radio Caracas Televisión revolves around the state's refusal to renew the license of a television channel of a television channel for eminently political reasons. Although the state argued it was for technical reasons, the evidence in the case demonstrated that a clear abuse of power had taken place and that the decision to not renew the television channel's license was intended to punish it for an editorial, uh, editorial stance that was critical for the government. The case established important precedent in, the, in at least three following issues. Three, three issues. First, as you know, in contrast, in contrast to the European system, in the inter-American system, only human beings, like natural persons, have standing to bring claims before regional protection bodies. However, in the case of RCTV, the court allowed that closing the media outlet directly affect the rights of the channel's journalists, workers, and managers. In this case, it seems the court to a certain extent agreed that there was a necessary connection between closure, the media outlet, and the violation of the human rights of the journalists and managers. This somewhat clears the skies, which since nine, the two nine, the, the 209, had very, very dark, had been very, very dark for cases on media outlets in the region. Second, the court found that although the state has authority to assign broadcasting licenses, it cannot use these, his authorities to, to authority to punish or reward media outlets based on their editorial stances. Finally, the judgment found that states have the, an obligation to issue clear and precise regulations for the process of assigning frequencies that establish objective criteria that avoid arbitrariness and encourage pluralism and diversity. The second case, in the second case, um, Lopez Lon et al versus Honduras. Um, the court ruled on a complaint from a number of judges who had been subject to discipl disciplinary proceedings for protesting against the COP d'etat the that removed the elected president of Honduras from power in 2009. In, in this case, I mean, the, the complaint brought by the Inter-American Commission uh, to the court asked for the judgments to recognize the judge's right to publicly criticize institutions as long as this criticism do not affect the principle of uh, judicial autonomy and independence. Uh, but the court just did an oiter dictum on the right of judges to freedom of expression. The court constructs a kind of innominate right to resistance in context of serious institutional upheaval. For the court in these borderline situations, it is disproportionate to prevent judges as citizens 
from freely exercising the right to freedom of expression, to assembly, and to political participation. And I'm just going to mention that the we we have the intermaking system. We have two bodies as the former European system. We have the court and the commission. Those are the most important cases, uh, the court cases. But we have two important cases from the commission published in 2015. Um, I, I don't have much time, so let me just. I would like just to mention something very, very. Free. I promise you, I'm going to take. But this is this is this is, this is this is. I mean, I need to show this. This is my ethical commitment. We do have our own Erdogan in the Americas. So just to show you some of the cases that we had in 2015 about Ecuador. Um, 17 years old boy convicted for dishonoring the president. And you can see the fines for judicial defamation against the president. Another fine for making twisted references to the president's sexual orientation and accusing him of abusing women. 15 days in prison for using Twitter to discredit and dishonor a minister of needs, ordered to appear at a preliminary hearing for suggesting corruption of a previous government official. Proceeds again, a cartoonist for cartoons that were considered offensive and discriminatory, and I can go and on and on. So I'm not going to congratulate, as, as, as uh, they did yesterday to Erdogan, I'm not going to congratulate uh, Rafael Correa for doing this, but I would like to uh, tell you <laughs> that this is happening in the Americas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katana. So um, before we give you the microphones, uh, I would like to ask a, a couple of questions to the panelists and then just share this um, conversation with, with, with you all. Uh, first of all, Thais, um, would, you, would you talk a little about the fact that there's a big discussion in Brazil regarding this, this um, jurisprudence that you talked about, uh, what happens when the books are aimed to defame a person? When, when the biographies are, are aimed to that and that there's more and more people doing this kind of biographies. If you have yes, oh, uh, is it working? Yes, yes. Uh, just that the, our constitution in Brazil uh, doesn't uh, permit that uh, uh, an order, that there is an order to prevent a publication. So uh, when a publication is done, we, you can sh sue the, the editor or the author just to, to claim for damage, uh, things like that. But you can't, cannot prevent the, the publication. As I show you, uh, this uh, Roberto Carlos case, uh, for instance, um, the court did, didn't know what the notices, the newspaper was going to publish next, on the next editions. So uh, how could they uh, prohibit uh, the the publication if they even didn't know what is going was going to publish? What I usually I say in Brazil is that this kind of order that prevent a publication is even worse that we had uh, during military uh, period. Because at least during military period, uh, the censors were on the news, uh, to, how do you call the uh, newsroom? Yeah, so. Yes, they, they were inside the newsroom and seeing what you were going to publish. Then they, uh, they oh no, this kind of information you can publish. But now this judicial censorship that we have um, sometimes in Brazil, it's a kind of, uh, it's even worse because they don't know what we are going. So uh, sometimes we used to receive uh, an order uh, like that, we can't uh, speak about uh, a politician. Mm -hmm. So how can a newspaper um, be uh, prohibited of speaking about a politician or something like that? So that's more or less. So uh, would you, Agustina, after uh, Macri took office, <laughs> uh, the first thing or the, the second thing probably he did in Argentina was to start banning the newspapers that used to accuse him of several crimes, including um, being involved with um, human trafficking and stuff like that, uh, that some of us have investigated. So um, would, you, would you tell us, uh, would you talk a little about um, 
the emerging trends and identify specific cases we should watch for this year and next year mm. regarding this push up of the president? Um, in, in terms of emerging trends, um, what, a, what, a, well, freedom of expression issues tend to go in circular waves in Argentina. When we thought we had a clear and consistent doctrine on defamation, we suddenly have a case like Canicoa Corral that basically said that you had a right to freedom of expression, but you didn't have a right to insult people. And this was a federal judge. And so it, it, it went backwards three steps, and then it went forward again another three steps, and we keep going at it with more cases that defend freedom of expression and less that, that, uh, that shortens it. But there are still cases coming out of the same tribunal that are not consistent in their views. Um, however, one, one emerging norm that I, that I do see, and this is not only in Argentina but across the region, is the need for transparency in public um, organizations and organisms. And the reason why I say this is that in Argentina it's not obvious. We don't have an access to information law. We have uh, an executive degree, decree from 2003 that granted access to information um, on the federal executive power, but didn't apply to Congress nor the judiciary. However, there have been court decisions, lower court decisions, particularly last year, um, upholding the right to access uh, to information, to, to information held by Congress, their uh, staffers, their budgets, the distribution of their budgets, and, and whatnot. And the Supreme Court has also self-regulated um, in a manner to grant access to information and has been providing further uh, public hearings and further instances for dialogue and for transparency. And they have all agreed, without a law, that this is a norm that they should abide by. And in the same sense, uh, last year I did a small research on um, the role of public case hearings before the Inter-American Commission and how they affect the legitimacy of the decisions coming out of the organism. And there seems to be a correlation between the transparency in processing these cases and the legitimacy of the final reports uh, um, issued by the Inter-American Commission. So that's interesting. Um, in terms of challenges for the future, which is your Macri question, uh, so uh, upon taking office in, in December, there were two decrees, the executive decrees, that were adopted by the executive power. One of them amending and changing the media law, and the other one amending and changing the telecommunications law. Um, this happened 10 days after the, the taking of office, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the two laws had been adopted by Congress, they had been declared constitutional by the Supreme Court, and they were overturned, basically, by an executive decree uh, based on the alleged need and urgency of um, combining both laws in order to promote um, investment. So we'll see what happens with the new law and without judging the, the, the outcome of this whole thing, the bottom line is that it, it does show a, a, a pervasive institutional weakness. And um, it certainly puts us on alarm for the future. Uh, the other very interesting thing was the adoption, as I mentioned, of the anti-protests protocol. There had been debates in Congress to regulate um, protests in the streets, particularly in the capital, which are pretty intense, uh, both in number and in the disruptions that they cause to the city. And there had been a number of bills introduced, and no bill was able to pass the debate in Congress. So the Ministry of Security basically put this protocol forward that regulates the issue without any legislative debate whatsoever. So that's also something to be very cautious about. Thank you. 
Okay, Dario, with, um, um, in 2008, some of you might know this, but in Mexico, um, we had a judicial reform, which means that the ref this reform is really important to Mexico because um, the justice system is overloaded, outmodel and dysfunctional, and um, the implementation of adversarial uh, criminal uh, procedures will eventually, hopefully, change the system. So given this, uh, the opportunity to have a new criminal system, do you think, do you see anything in the future um, with, um, I don't know, improvement in this regard, or are you pessimistic? Well, I am pessimistic. You know me. <laughs> I mean, that's. <laughs> well, but I'm a I human rights defender, public. so it, it comes. <laughs> it comes with the job, I think. Um, no, I, I think. Um, well, the, we have uh, six states already that have uh, switched uh, to the to uh, judicial si the judicial system, and and the numbers are not are not falling in the way the way it was supposed to be, or the way the the the, the arguments in favor. Of the of the change of the system, um, that doesn't mean that it cannot work. But I, I think it's more of a the, the, the change in in the mentality, um, and and I want I want to relate this case um, to a to an like I had a, a, the opportunity to speak to I think the one of the best judges that we have in Mexico. It's called Judge Silva, in the case of uh, of a very well known uh, journalist uh, Carmen Aristegui. And, and the, the, the case of Carmen Ariste was very complex uh, because it, it argued that um, um, firing her, it was uh, using, she was a very w renowned journalist with a very popular talk show, a news talk show, um, and she was fired. And they, of course, they, 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 the company argued, or the media argued, that it was a private matter. Uh, and and she 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 sued uh, not only because of uh, the breach of contract, but she sued because uh, 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 in the public uh, she was her show was in the public interest, uh, and and it was really interesting because because Judge Silva told me that if he would have I think the the arguments would have been stronger in a adversary uh, in a oral system yeah, uh, and and she and he said that. Those the, the the change of, of visions because uh, in his ruling he favoring uh, he gave the amparo to 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 Carmen, um, saying that yes indeed uh, it's uh, it's it's a matter of public interest, and and I think uh, the, the 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 change in the in the judicial system uh, when you see um, that it has become well it ha no it hasn't become but it's still very politicized. Uh, we have a Supreme Court that we just uh, are changing judges right now, uh, and it will change for the next 10 years because of the appointments of the of the Senate, and the the majority of the Senate is lies between the major party, which is a ruling party, uh, together with their with their allies. So I I don't see the change, the cultural change in the judiciary, that must be there in order to. To change doesn't matter what system. Um, they they go. Although they, we have to say the Supreme Court has been very advanced in transparency. I mean, I think in all the judicial system is the is the piece that you could say it has transparency. It has very progressive ruling in most cases regarding freedom of expression. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't fall down to the rest of the judiciary. And, and I think that's that's something that we have to look upon. So, Catalina, do you, do you see any uh, emerging norms regarding the region or specific uh, countries? And you said there's a regression of the court, and I was wondering if this represents the regression of the political systems and um, stupidization. Is that is that a good word <laughs> of our politicians all over the region? Is that is that something that we? I think we we had. Um, important progress during the first decade. Okay. Really important progress. Uh, not just within the inter-American system, but in some countries. Um, but in the last six years, yes, I think there has been a regression. A deep regression in some countries. Um, n but now that Venezuela is broken, 
and and the the currency that they were uh, pushing um, and il this illiberal current uh, is weakened. Mm -hmm. I think we can we can uh, our, our hope. I mean, because uh, what we as I mean, for example, in the court mm -hmm. last year we have good cases. We haven't had good cases in the last uh, like eight years. Mm -hmm. And last year it was like, my God, what happened? Who had changed those people? <laughs> no, uh, and it, it is good. They huh? were the same. They the were the same. The position was the they same. Were the same. <laughs> they were the same. They were the same. But what what happened first? The public reaction against the Memoli case. Mm -hmm. No one would expect this in in the Americas ever. I mean, having like the most important news papers in the region criticizing, but huge criticizing the court, and naming the judges. I mean, can you imagine the day that the court opened its session in Brazil? Yes. The whole yes. court in Brazil, they used to uh, have sessions in San Jose, Costa Rica. Yes. This is where the, their, their work, the headquarters of the court are. But they decided to go to Brazil. They were think that they were they, have, they are going to be tra treated as a yes. With respect. No, kings. Yeah. <laughs> The very same day that they opened the sessions, this morning, that morning, Estado de Sao Paulo in O Globo published enormous, huge notes criticizing the court. So I think for them it was yes. like a huge surprise. Yes. And it was great because <laughs> one can argue that this is the reason because of they decided to protect freedom of expression in 2015. And this is, th this is what the media can, can do for, for us. I mean, sure. so yeah, this was, this was good. Yeah. For okay, us so lawyers or for us journalists? <laughs> for us as, 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 as a citizens. <laughs> as a citizens, yes. <laughs> so we have time for a couple of questions from... Somebody has a question, a comment? Yeah. Yes, of course. Can you use the mic? Sorry. Um, so it's about the fact that in Brazil uh, our democracy is still very young. It's only 30 years um, old or young. Um, so I was wondering how this political and economic crisis, do you think how it will affect um, the fight for, global, for freedom of expression in Brazil? Do you think it will help or will it weaken or maybe it's too soon to tell? Do you see any trend? And it can be open to all panelists, I mean, Brazil, it's... Thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, for your easy question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we were speaking about it uh, this morning uh, because our country, Brazil now, is uh, completely divided. So we have... Uh, uh, half people, half of the, the population is against uh, the impeachment of our president. And uh, the other part is for the impeachment of our president. And the country is completely divided. And uh, this is uh, mirroring, I don't know, uh, a very strong discussion in all, all situations and also in media. And uh, as former President Lula, uh, for, for example, was criticizing the media so much, so much, and we have uh, we've uh, faced a lot of uh, attacks uh, against journalists during the protests. Uh, it was uh, it was noticed. All those attacks was uh, was noticed. So um, they were noticed. So uh, we don't know uh, exactly how, where we are going to, all those things are going to lead, but uh, we think that it can affect the, the, the freedom of expression, but uh, we, are not, uh, we are not facing this now, but I think that maybe, Mike. Yes. Blaming the press is uh, always a resource of uh, the ones who are being criticized. I mean, Donald Trump. Hugo Chavez, yeah. Rafael Correa, yes. Erdogan. I mean, you can see this in, in, in Hungary, in Russia, whatever. In 
when they when they get the goal to divide societies, yes, it could cause a very very deep our harm. So it stands on civil society to I mean, relay on or whatever on civil society to to stand. Know, to, to, to understand that what they are trying to do is to save their own uh, prestige, but to defend those values that, that they are trying to diminish. Okay, so um, if nobody has... Uh, okay, yes, please. Um, I have a question about um, <clears throat> norms and the law that you spoke about in Brazil about uh, biographies and the prohibitions against unauthorized biographies. And it's some articles that I've read about it say that the justification for the law in Brazil was really an economic one, really one of economic fairness, that it's unfair for media, especially large media, to profit by telling someone else's life story, that the telling of a life story ought to belong to the individual. And I'm wondering whether that you see that in any other areas of media, the conflict between uh, this idea of uh, freedom of expression to discuss the lives of other people, but that competing idea that it's unfamiliar perhaps to many, but the competing idea that it's just economically unfair to deprive an individual of the profit from telling their life story. Uh. I, it, I think that this argument, it's not an argument. Because, uh, in fact, uh, if you have a biography on, uh, okay, I was telling about Roberto Carlos, which is a, a composer, but he's a very public person. And uh, unauthorized biographies, uh, they are, oh, in no world we have that. Uh, biographies. They, they, these personalities. They are part of uh, the history. So I think that they can't uh, ask for something if you want to tell their story, their story, their biography. Uh, if you think about, I don't know any other uh, president who's vote. I don't know if you if you want to write a biography on Lula or I don't know. We can. You can do it because they they are not uh, they are not um, it's not the, their biographies are not their property. It's our the citizens' property. It's part of the history. So I think they don't they don't have this right to to claim for uh, payments for this uh, for these biographies. Okay. Yes. And yes. Oh. Okay. Very quick. No, I like to make a note on this. Uh, of course, uh, the, the the profit is. I mean, it's a side question because all outlets of media is based on a profit model or non-profit. So I would say this is a out of question. But the pro I think the key question about, about biographies and many issues of the press is the timing. I mean, uh, you can sue someone, some reporter, some publishing house after publication yes. if you think that content is uh, injuring or defamating someone, you can, uh, everyone must, uh, must have their right to protect uh, their reputation, but after publication. The key issue is you can't prohibit it someone to publish that. That, that's what, that. that was the point in Brazil. And that, as Thais pointed very well, when you prohibited that before, you are imagining what will be published. So, so that's crazy. I, I, I forbid you to publish something based on what I think you'll be publishing. So it's crazy. It's uh, preview censorship. But there's actually a, a discussion here in Latin America and Mexico. There was five cases that were lost from authors and journalists that wrote biographies, and they lost in civil courts. And mainly they lost because of that, because they supposedly made money out of somebody else's life. It was obviously very powerful people. I'm the only one who won one case. It was against, uh, I mean, there was the victim of trafficking, and she went back to the traffickers, and they sued me in the civil courts and they wanted 10 million pesos because they thought that's what I made with the book. 
And the argument that the judge was going for was exactly that. It was that I was making money off of her life. So she had the right to write her own biography and make money, even though she was with the traffickers. But anyway, I was the only one who won it. So there's, a, there's an ongoing discussion on this. It's like, it's like it's only money. It's only about money. But for us, it's public information. So it's yeah, a, sure. of course, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. Yes, but this is prior censorship. I mean, if you, yeah, course, if you no, bring this guy to an yeah, intervention system, even the judges that I was talking about, yeah. they had to recognize that this is prior citizenship and, yes. and, uh, and the convention of course. Uh, yes. um, Well, I, I was not going to comment on that, but just, um, just to say that the, the case from Brazil was uh, nominated for, for an award, and we did have quite, uh, quite a lot of discussion because uh, prior censorship on biographies is actually quite common, uh, including in my own country. I suspect uh, this is uh, the one thing that is the object of most, maybe one of you, my French friends, can, um, uh, can confirm. I think uh, biographies are quite heavily, uh, not heavily, but there are quite a few cases of biographies uh, that are being um, the object of prior restraint. I think the last one I can think of was the uh, King of Morocco, uh, but uh, there may um, there may have been there, there have been quite quite a few. So this is why um, you know we we really spoke quite a lot about uh, about that case for for this award. Uh, but my questions were uh, twofold. The first uh, one was whether or not we are going to see very soon some more directly internet cases at the Inter-American Court. Because uh, every time I, I see you, you're saying the court is not ready, the court is not ready. Do you think the court is ready? Because I think um, given the fact that it is a progressive court, it will be very interesting to see how it's going to go on, on some of those issues of liability, right to be forgotten, uh, autocomplete, you know, all, all of those, um, all of those questions. And then I had a question for Dario around the Chiapas case. Uh, what made? Wh why was it such a good decision in the co in the judicial context of Mexico? How did we come up? How did we come uh, get to that uh, excellent decision? And you can explain that. And then Lydia, I was wondering whether you could update us on your case because it's at the HRC now, the Human Rights uh, Committee. Thank you. No, darling, I think we are not going to see soon internet cases at the Inter-American Court, just because uh, a matter of time. It takes a long time to long bring time, yeah. a case until, so yeah. before you have to go be, before the Inter-American Commission, and then, and as far as I know, there's no one case before the commission. So, but you can see in the paper that I send uh, to Columbia, you will see uh, some cases related to the so-called right to be forgotten, uh, intermediary responsibilities, uh, so on, in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, yes, and Colombia. Sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, just to add on that, there's, there's a case that is going to have a hearing this week, I think, that deals with privacy issues and surveillance. So that might be interesting, although not at the Inter-American Commission. Um, I think it's, it was very straightforward, the, the decision of the Supreme Court, what it says. It, uh, it made, um, a, of course, an exercise of ponderation between uh, security uh, issues and the need to, to access, in, access information. Um, but I think my, what really struck me in the, in the ruling was that it made a really, really good argument of, um, of, the, of the need, of how much information do we need in a, in a state of uh, such high levels of violence. And it said that, um, that everybody with a, with a smartphone it's, a, it's an agent uh, that needs to engage in public, uh, in scrutiny of the public forces. So, of course, it underlined the importance of journalism, but it says that it, they, cannot, they cannot punish any citizen that sees something and puts it up in the web 
and 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 really provides that information for professional journalists to go and 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 search and and go deeper on the in the in the story. So I think that um, that um, that argument on on the on on that need of information um, that it's just picked up by by anyone that has a, a has a the capacity of a, mo a smartphone to to have that. Um, for me, that was the, the the striking. Of course, it made a lot of arguments on on how it limits freedom of expression, how it limits access to information. But um, I think that argument was really surprising for me. But do you think it was a straightforward decision? Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, but I'm, I mean, I was straightforward in the in the in the argument. It was not vague. It provided a, it it made a very clear ruling on on why Alconeo is um it's it's unconstitutional it, and it hinders freedom of expression. I'm not comparing that <laughs> for other ones. <laughs> well, um, on my case, well, I wish I had the good news, but not yet. We don't know nothing, and we asked them, and they said that it's not a good idea to ask the commission how your case is going. But, well, they, they just arrested my torturer, and I'm going through trial, and we demonstrate it. So I might win. He will spend five years in jail, and then he'll come out, and then I'll see if I move to New York or something. But anyway, that's pretty much it. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, thank you for not falling asleep and taking siesta time. <laughs>